Good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to be presenting today as part of our um, very important BME seminar series. The title of my talk is Elastin as a Trigger to Accelerate Valve Regeneration. So moving on to the next slide. Now, there are a number of different approaches in heart valve tissue engineering. Um, some involve the usage of cells and scaffolds. In other cases, uh, only cells are used, although that's not very prevalent anymore, given that um, there have been a lot of limitations with solely using cell therapies. But in other cases, a scaffold that has certain properties to hopefully promote cell migration into the scaffold and then hopefully have endogenous cells facilitate regeneration on the scaffold is another procedure. And of course, most recently, there has been interest in looking at the possibility of combining cells with scaffolds and having some maturation of the tissues using what is called a bioreactor. And in short, we have used a combination of both scaffold only, as well as a cell scaffold with bioreactor approach. And we have used this beyond just a tissue model system. We are hopeful that this approach may actually reach the clinic for uh, human trials, hopefully in the next five years. And I'll explain the context of all of this next. So um, in terms of mechanical conditioning, uh, because I have a relatively brief time to present a lot of data that's evolved over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, um, you know, we have identified that there are certain mechanical environments, specifically from oscillatory fluid-induced shear stresses, where there's flow of uh, you know, a liquid moving back and forth, let's say flow of a media. And this is actually pretty prevalent for valves. And what we mean by that is we did some initial work a while ago looking at samples that are flexing, as you can see in this movie, and also coupled with a flow environment. And when you have this combination of flex and flow in this flex flow bioreactor, we found that there were the creation of these oscillatory fluid-induced stresses on the sample. And ironically, when we looked into the physiological relevance of this, we found that this was actually already reported to occur on the native heart valves. In this case, this is the aortic heart valve. And you can see that there is, on the aortic side, these oscillating flow stresses. And later on, when we did some assessment of the phenotype of bone marrow derived stem cells that were subjected to this oscillatory flow condition, we found that these bone marrow stem cells begin to exhibit a valvular phenotype, both in terms of an activated smooth muscle cell phenotype, which is indicative of their active uh, ability to remodel and to be able to secrete valvular tissues. And they're actively involved in tissue remodeling processes which is part of the activated smooth muscle cell phenotype, although it's also been known in disease progression. But here we uh, you know, were able to appreciate in the context of engineered tissue formation. And also we saw under flex flow conditions, more of an endothelial cell phenotype expressed by these bone marrow derived stem cells. And so, as I said, when you go into the literature and more from a molecular biology standpoint, there was some work done by Julian Vermoos group where he exhibited that you know, there was oscillatory flow that was modulating certain uh, transcription factors and KLF2A uh, gene expression. And what he went on to do was that he developed a uh, mouse model in which they knocked out this important KLF2A gene. And when he first uncovered that the KLF2A was directly regulated through oscillatory flow, and then subsequently did a knockout model in mice with the KLF2A gene knocked out, he found that these mice, essentially, these were mouse embryo, and you know basically when they eventually developed, they had defective valves in them. And that pretty much concluded to us that if oscillatory flow has an important, such a critical role in normal healthy valve development, it could be leveraged in a regenerative medicine standpoint. And so from that context, um, we also looked at some studies looking at scaffold only. And here we have uh, a bioscaffold porcine small intestinal submucosa, which is also an FDA approved scaffold. And our clinician uh, colleagues at Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital were treating children born with severe valve defects with pieces. 
in the form of compassionate care because there really wasn't any other treatment available for them. And they found that they were, you know, kids who were supposed to have passed away within a few days, but they were surviving a year, two years into the process. Some were also able to utilize this approach as a bridge for prosthetic valve uh, implantation at some point. And so there was certainly a lot of uh, positive benefit in the use of pieces. And so we also began working with them and we switched out our scaffolds from what we were using to using pieces since this was already FDA approved and it's got its viscoelastic uh, properties. And we also demonstrated that at least within the acute time frame, these pieces valves functioned as well as uh, commercially available bioprosthetic heart valves. And so in that context, we wanted to see how well it performs in a growing juvenile baboon model as a non-human primate model. And so we found that these valves um, did support somatic growth in the acute term. And you can see here, we define what's called a normalized aspect growth ratio or NAGR. And ideally, NAGR has a value of one. And if you compare baboons to humans, we see that the baboons uh, don't have as good of a, a, a NAGR uh, ratio as the humans, you know, humans at 0.92. That's not really surprising because baboons grow a lot more between the ages of one to two years old compared to humans. Uh, but nonetheless, we began to see that as we extended the duration of the valve, the ability for the valve to grow with the baboon decreased. As you can see here, at 14 months, it decreased to 0.62. At seven months, it was at 0.74. So that became a concern. And then we actually explanted a lot of these valves, looking at their uh, biochemistry and the histology. What we ended up finding was that there was a lot of tissue formation, even as early as three months post-explantation. And however, we found that um, there wasn't much elastin content in the valve. There was a significant collagen and proteoglycan content, also some fibrin. But we also noticed there was roughly about 5 to 10% of the valve. In this case, you can see even at 11 months post-implantation, where there was still some pieces bioscaffold. And we purchased our pieces from, uh, or we, we, we got our pieces from uh, Core Matrix, a company that has an FDA-approved pieces bioscaffold. And unfortunately, we didn't get 100% tissue filling. There was about 5%, 5 to 10% of the valve, even at 11 months, that was still unfilled with tissue. And ultimately, that became a site for um, you know, chronic inflammation and ultimately valve failure. So we know that even though, in spite of the fact that we did find some porcine cellular debris on these valves, they're supposed to be decellularized, but we found a few porcine cellular debris. The porcine cells there didn't elicit this response. If they had, we would have seen an immune response within a few days to a few weeks. But remember, this is after 11 months, and we know that this is directly associated with 5 to 10% of the valve being unfilled. And essentially, the body has then adversely attacked this unfilled component of the valve, as you can see here with these irregular-shaped immune cells and it elicited a hostile immune response, which essentially led to valve failure in all the uh, baboon uh, juvenile animal models that we experimented on. One nice thing was that we found that some components of this, I, I should mention this was a mitral valve replacement in the juvenile baboons. We found that the neocordia component did generate seamlessly with pieces, so you don't need any other intervention to purely use pieces. But obviously, a mitral valve apparatus with its annulus, with its leaflets, and neocordae is, you know, a multivariable uh, component system, and we need all of these components to be able to regenerate. And unfortunately, that didn't happen in the case of the annulus, nor did it happen in the case of the leaflets. It did happen in the case of the neocordae, which seamlessly, just using a scaffold alone with no cells, nothing else, pieces facilitated uh, seamless regeneration of neocordae into the papillary muscles. Um, of these animals. And so um, this is another slide showing at 20 months, and we saw similar situations with regions of lack of tissue filling. Again, not a small, not a, a big amount, maybe about 5 to 10 percent of the scaffold, even as early as three months post uh, implantation, had really filled the scaffold by up to 90 percent. But at, even at 20 months, we saw there was a little bit of, you know, 5 to 10 percent of scaffold that was unfilled, and ultimately that led to a hostile immune response, which led to the valve failure. So then the question is, can we, in a three-month window, you know, have 100% tissue filling and regeneration? So our approach is then to leverage our work with bioreactors and stem cells. 
And here we look at some cell seeded pieces, tubular scaffolds that are essentially already our tubes and we can basically form sutures at maybe 120 degrees apart or 180 degrees apart to make tricuspid or bicuspid type valves. Of course, a mitral valve being bicuspid, so roughly about 180 degrees apart. Okay, maybe about 150 to 180, 180 degrees apart, and we suture it down uh, lengthwise, and then we are able to then uh, have a 150 to 180 degrees of conferential separation between those sutures and create essentially leaflets, essentially from a tube. So relatively simple in the geometry, and we see that these with uh, bone marrow stem cells. And here's a, a movie of... Sorry for the music, but uh, here's a movie of the oscillatory flow condition on the tubular seeded valve with bone marrow derived stem cells. As you can see here, we repeated these experiments on these tubular valves, and then we proceeded to understand what happens. And I guess in the interest of time, the biggest thing that we found amazingly was that not only was it exhibiting the valve phenotype, but these bone marrow stem cells were then secreting a significant amount of elastin. And elastin from the literature has been shown to be a trigger for accelerating re regeneration by promoting chemotaxis. And there has been a lot of interest in maybe looking at bioscaffolds derived from elastin-rich xenogenic tissues, such as from the lungs or from the bladder. But of course, in our case, um, this is, um, this is, you know, uh, allogeneic elastin. And uh, of course, allogeneic elastin um, has also been shown now in the literature to be having certain benefits over xenogenic elastin because it does help to facilitate elastin to cell native cell communications and also uh, preventing any kind of adverse xenogenic hostile response by having a xenogenic extracellular matrix. And so if we can coat and deposit a thin layer of allogeneic elastin-rich tissues onto pieces, then we feel that within that three month window that we have where valve is able to function well and get 100% tissue filling and 100% valve regeneration, then that would be something that will uh, last uh, hopefully as a permanent valve replacement strategy, particularly for children born with a critical valve disease. And here, one more step, of course, is that once we have the uh, elastin there, we do not want to retain the cells that produce the elastin, the cells would only create a problem because it, what studies have shown is that when stem cells are implanted in the valve location, it leads to leaflet fusion with the surrounding vasculature due to an overabundance of tissue formation. It can cause overgrowth and panis formation. And so having the cells there after they've done their incredible work of depositing engineered ECM, and in our case, engineered extracellular matrix with elastin-rich uh, a matrix, would be essentially sufficient, we believe, to trigger uh, chemotaxis to native cells and facilitate regeneration within the three-month window that pieces we know for sure conservatively works. And so with that being said, we have essentially been able to safely remove the bone marrow derived stem cells while leaving its collagen and elastin secretions intact, as you can see here, before uh, the elastin and collagen was removed. And after it was removed, you can see we have pretty much uh, comparable levels of collagen and elastin within these engineered tissues. And so our next step is really to uh, move forward with allogeneic elastin deposited pieces valves. And we're going to try to return to the baboons and look at its ability to serve as a mitral valve replacement in juvenile baboons until they reach adulthood, which in the case of baboons is 60 months. So basically we could study child to adulthood in a matter of three to four years in a baboon model. And of course, in humans, it's 18 years. But if we're successful in three to four years from child to adulthood in a baboon model, obviously, then hopefully, fingers crossed, in about five years or so, we should be able to then translate this to first in human trials to serve the population who truly need an immediate solution. And a regenerative solution would be perhaps the best way to treat them. And this subpopulation, of course, I'm talking about is children born with a critical valve disease. And so we're very excited to hopefully be able to move to that process in about five years to first in human uh, trials, like I said, in about five years, hopefully. And with that being said,
Uh, I'd like to acknowledge our entire team full of fantastic students, both graduate and undergraduate students. In particular, I'd like to uh, acknowledge um, Ariadna Herrera. I'd like to acknowledge um, Brittany Gonzalez, who's uh, now no longer a student in my lab, who has graduated and has moved on to a postdoc position at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Manuel Perez, um, Guime, Assad, and Denise, as well as several of these undergraduate students. All of them have been involved in this project in some capacity. Uh, a large part of this project, of course, is connected to both Brittany Gonzalez's and Ariadna's work. Ariadna is an ongoing PhD student in the lab, and she was uh, directly involved in some of the decellularization of the stem cell that I showed. And Brittany was the one who found that amazing discovery of elastin formation as part of her dissertation. So with that being said, I'm very happy to take any questions at this point, and thank you for your time and attention. It was a pleasure speaking to all of you. Questions? Sure. Yes. So uh, you mentioned alpha SMA increase in expression through oscill oscillatory shear. Yeah. I was just wondering, like, what kind of cell types are at play? Because presumably the uh, endothelial cells are the ones that are being exposed to oscillatory shear stress. And then alpha SMA is usually expressed in smooth muscle cells, which would be in the interstitial um, cell heterogeneity soup. So what's your, what's your take on that? So these were bone marrow stem cells. So basically, we exposed bone marrow stem cells to these oscillatory flow conditions. And we found that uh, a portion of them, especially deeper within the tissue, exhibited alpha SMA. And the ones on the surface exhibited CD31. So how did the bone marrow stem cells know how to migrate and kind of copy the structure of the valve phenotype? We don't know. That's something we need to work with the molecular biologist on to understand the mechanisms. But for now, we know they're able to support the valve phenotype, both in terms of alpha SMA and CD31. And of course, like I said, um, the amazing result is they're also secreting a lot of elastin in the tissue. Normal valves have about 10% elastin. We're getting about 8%, so which is pretty close to normal valves. Yes. Is the, the KLF bar, is that correct? The beam? The KLF 2A, yeah. It, um, is that used, does, does that mean produce something that helps with the elastin, or is that something else? What am I going to the KLF 2A is an important gene in, um, in embryonic development of the valve. And basically, that group from France was able to show that in a knockout model, and they, they were able to show that KLF 2A is directly mitigated by oscillatory flow during valve development in a, in a you know, basically in an embryo and in fetal development. And then they went to a knockout model and said, okay, if we knock out KLF 2A, which is directly regulated by oscillatory flow, what's going to happen? Well, what happened was the valves were defected. So that means when a child or when an infant is, or when a, when a baby a fetus is growing, uh, basically at some point oscillatory flow is regulating proper healthy development of the valve. And if that's true for a fetus, that may be true for our in vitro experiments as well, which we hope will be the case. Okay, I think we should move on to our yes. next speaker to keep up time. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Suran Jiao. Uh, uh, so the, the title for today is High Resolution Model Biomedical Optimality. I have a subtitle, so one translation to the eye for imaging. Okay, so here, uh, I just present uh, some conclusions uh, from a publication in JAMA, uh, I guess, in uh, 2016. Uh, uh, so the, uh, the conclusion is that Americans fear going blind over losing any other of their senses. Uh, so, uh, uh, so this is their research. Okay, so what specifies here is that, you know, the, the vision is really important uh, for our humans. So, uh, so keeping on vision, you know, keep keeping the heart of our eye is really, uh, uh, you know, uh, very important for our life. Okay, so what is research in my lab? Uh, the goal actually uh, in my lab is to use uh, technological innovations to help prevent and cure blindness. Uh, 
uh, uh, so we what we are doing is actually biomedical optical imaging is we use the light uh, to image uh, optical tissues uh, in the eye. Uh, but, but the current focus in my lab is mainly imaging the eye. We are developing technologies. Uh, so currently we focus on three different technologies, all are optical methods. Uh, the first one is optical current tomography called OCT. Uh, the second one is photoacoustic uh, microscopy. Uh, the third one is micro model functional image. So we, we mainly focus on these three uh, areas. Then the target for all these technologies are the eye. So we image the eye uh, to review the structure and the functions uh, of the uh, you know, different part of that. So here that's show you some examples of the uh, the image that we well, we took uh, with our uh, instrument that developed by uh, my lab. Uh, on the left, the top left, and the other, uh, these are the cross-sectional image, high resolution uh, of human retina. Okay, so these are normal. There you can see the uh, uh, there's a kind of uh, Dented area, so that's the uh, that's called the phobia. That's the central of our vision. Now we have updates. Now you can see all the different cell layers in really high detail. Uh, on the right, uh, those are diseased the retina. Then you can see the uh, you know the change of the structure uh, uh, and also the uh, you know the the the, the, the disease the location. The first one is a match of the whole. Some of you may have already known that. Uh, and then uh, the lower one is related, I think it's, uh, it's uh, diabetes neuropathy. So I, I can't remember the details. And uh, so the upper part is for revealing the structures of the retina. And the lower one is to image the blood vessels. So we can use Doppler effect. But that's not ultrasound, it's optical. Method so we can uh, image the blood flow. So it's bi directional, you can image the direction and also the flow speed uh, of the retinal blood vessels. If I show you some examples. Uh, my lab actually is the first to image uh, small rodent models and also uh, birds. Uh, with a uh, high resolution OCT. Uh, some people use other different, different other methods, but for using high resolution three-dimensional uh, OCT image birds and small rodents is done by my lab. Then uh, the upper image shows the uh, raptor, the retinal structure of the raptor with uh, high resolution OCT. The special with raptors is they have two phobia. Uh, for human, we have only one phobia, but for for this type of work, they have two phobia. It means they can simultaneously focus on two objects, right? For, hum for humans, we can only focus at, uh, at a single time at only one point, right? So that's, we have, really we have one phobia, but they have two phobia. Here shows you uh, a image of uh, a mouse. Uh, so this one actually is the first of uh, uh, high resolution image of a mouse that uh, we also applied our technology to image the transplant of the cornea. So uh, these work were done uh, at Boston Palmer uh, Institute and one with the faculty over there. Uh, we also imaged uh, the tumor. It's, uh, this is uh, a special tumor for children. Uh, it's called a retinal blastoma. But what we uh, image is a mouse model, okay? Uh, in this model, they direct a, uh, it's a cancer, type of cancer in the retina. Actually, we image the, uh, because we, 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 we have three dimensional capabilities, so we can image the volume, we can calculate the volume, then we can qu uh, quantify, then follow the growth of the, of the tumor. Uh, so the lower one just shows uh, the application of the technology for a rat model of glaucoma. You know, there are major branding diseases uh, in the developed world. The first one is age-related macular degeneration. 
The second one is called glaucoma. The third one is uh, diabetic retinopathy. But for the underdeveloped countries, maybe uh, cataract is number one. Okay, but for developed countries, uh, so we have, we have major uh, three major uh, primary diseases that are a little different. So this one I show you the uh, result, uh, the uh, some of the image we uh, we uh, acquired with uh, with an invention by Manavi called a photoacoustic ophthalmoscopy. Okay, so we use. Uh, a method is called photoacoustic. It's a hybrid imaging technology. It shines light into the eye, then you detect the generated ultrasound uh, to do imaging. So it's also higher resolution, three dimensional. It can image the optical absorption contrast. So we take this technology and you can image the blood vessels and also melanin in the eye. So they have a specific, specific absorption contrast. Uh, so we combine different imaging technologies in a single platform. We can have uh, the upper one is uh, photoacoustics, then this is OCT. So we we combine them together and we can review simultaneously different features of the retina. Okay. Uh, we also do functional imaging. Uh, so this just shows a result. Uh, of molecular, molecular contrast with OCT. So basically we use different wavelength, uh, a broadband, different wavelength uh, of light to image the sensing molecule in the photoreceptor, like the rhodopsin. So this one that shows you the results. Uh, so with different exposure of light, we image the, you know, the, the refraction of the light of the uh, retina, you can see the bleaching effect. Actually, so all these are caused by the bleaching of the rhodopsin molecule. So these are uh, more recent development. Is uh, we call the quantitative imaging of the fusion in the RTE cells. Uh, so there's a special uh, chromophore uh, uh, in the retinal pigment epithelium, and this chromophore is a uh, is a a uh, byproduct of the uh, photo uh, transduction process. Okay, so it's a biomarker for the aging process of the retina. So if you, you can quantitatively unit this molecule, possibly you can monitor the aging process of the RTE cells. Okay, so what we do is we use visible light OCT. So traditional OCT is in the near infrared. But we invented the visible light OCT. So you use this one to generate both OCT and fluorescence of the molecules in RP cells. So then we can quantify the concentration of this molecule. Okay. Uh, so here is a result with, uh, with uh, a rodent, it's a, it's a uh, rat. So we have pigmented and albino rats when we. Quantify the conventional reperfusion, and we can see all the different attenuation factors are removed by our techniques. So we own, we can review the true quantification, the true quality of the fluorophore uh, reperfusion in the RT cells. So he, this curve, the vertical part, is the calculated from our environment, and the lateral axis is quantified. By mass spectroscopy, so then you can see the uh, the very good uh, correlation. Uh, so we also combine, as I mentioned, uh, different imaging technologies. For this one, we combine photoacoustics, OCT, and uh, autofluorescence. Uh, then with this method, uh, with this technology, actually, we can image different contrasts like. Absorption, that's photoacoustics, fluorescence. So we have spectral uh, molecular contrast. Then we have OCT. So OCT mainly has scattering contrast. So then we can combine different uh, uh, contrast together to reveal the different aspects. This is also a most uh, recent uh, development with Mark Model imaging. Uh, you know, traditionally, when you 
to scan the scanning scanning of uh, scanning micro microscopy the field of view is limited then uh, if you want to increase the field of view there are different methods then we uh, this one actually we combine optical scan with mechanical scan okay but there's a problem when you have a large field of view then the depth will affect the resolution of your system because the focus is very tight then if you have a, a variation of the profile then there will be a problem with our resolution so what we did is we did sort of dynamic focusing so basically when we scan then we change the focus according to the pro the profile of the uh the surface okay so with this one this is a model model imaging uh system that we can really review all the detailed structures of the, of a large field of it okay uh let me see yeah yeah so this is another uh uh development uh in multi model imaging system we combine photoacoustic microscopy oct the confocal fluorescence microscopy and also OTD. OTD is called optical doctor tomography. It's an image of blood vessels, the blood flow speed. Okay, so you can see different pictures reveal different features of the summer. So this is an in vivo experiment with mouse ear. Uh, even the mouse ear, then you can see the flow speed one after and the one in, as we can quantify the flow speed. Uh, this is an example of, uh, you know, the multimodal imaging. So this, uh, the difference is here we use OCTA. It's called O optical coherence tomography angiography. So and and there are, uh, we talk about angiography mainly you image the blood vessels. Okay. I just want to show you some examples. You see on the left, uh, you see the uh, the upper left, so that's the OCT and the angiography image. You can see the, down to the capillaries. Okay, very detailed blood vessel image. And on the right, that's conventional OCT. Okay, so these are projection of the 3D data onto the XY plane. So uh, then these shows the cross sectional image. Now those two are projections. Uh, and the rover is an uh, application on the retina. So this is a rat retina is uh, taken in vivo. So all these are in vivo images, right? If you have dead animal, you do imaging, there will be no blood vessel because there's no flow. Okay, so I'm talking about OCTA. Okay. So here just show you one example. So this one uh, is not done by my lab. <laughs> I borrowed from a friend, uh, but they, what this one is, is, uh, is a brain. So it's used for acoustics microscopy to image the blood vessels in the brain. Okay, then you can see really the details of all the capillaries in the uh, pieces. Okay, so that's it. Questions? Do you, do, um, do you use any contrast agents in any no. of your uh yeah if you want so actually we we we, we did some uh so two cases uh, two experiments we we use contrastation one is use the near infrared uh, photoacoustics we use a uh, nano i think it's nano rods nano rods to inject into uh, the blood vessels we image the you know the blood vessels so that that's right so that's one case that photoacoustic microscopy so that's one case the second case is we we'll do a uh, visible like OCT. Uh, we want to try the fluorescing angiography in the retina, so we, we try that one. So that's two cases we use. And what was the uh, agent for that one? Uh, fluorescent. Like, uh, it's a commercial available. So uh, uh, it's it, no, no, no. It's a fluorescent. Fluorescent is a, uh, actually sure. it's widely used in uh, in clinics. Fluorescent. Oh, fluorescein, I'm sorry. <laughs> fluorescent. Fluorescent. Right. C-E-I-S. Yeah. Yeah. Fluorescent. Fluorescent. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Anil Barwarti. I'm a faculty in the department. I've been here since pretty much when the department began. 
2004. And my lab uh, focuses on using near infrared optical imaging techniques. We do all the way from developing devices, which are more low cost, uh, portable, handheld, smartphone adaptable, or completely integrated devices for various clinical applications in the lab. So I am also one of the faculty of the four faculty we have in the department who work in optical techniques. So one is Dr. Zhao, Dr. Romela, and uh, Dr. Wei Cheng. A little bit about near infrared optical imaging. Near infrared optical imaging, if you take your cell phones and you turn on your flashlight and you stick it on your hand, you see there is a red that comes out on the other side. It's not blood. Many students, when I ask them that question, they say, oh, I'm seeing my blood. That's not true. It is because that white light that is in your phone has some amount of near infrared light, which is between the window that you're seeing there is called the therapeutic window. Where most of your major tissue absorbers, which is oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, water, all of this are very least absorbed. When something is not absorbed, it penetrates in and comes out. So near infrared is close to the red. So the light that's coming out is your near infrared signal that did not get completely absorbed by your skin, but actually went inside through the tissue and you're seeing it on the other side. When it comes out, the amount it got absorbed varies based upon the uh, concentration of these major absorbers. That's the fundamental idea. So let's say you went ahead and you, your finger got snapped at the door. There's, you have a blood clot, it's obvious. You can see the black and blue. Sometimes there's things which are changes inside that your eye cannot capture. But the differences in this absorption can be used to go ahead and differentiate the tissue types because you're looking at the oxygenation aspects, the deoxygenated blood concentrations, oxygen saturations, similar to your pulse oximeter. The various applications, uh, advantages, of course, the technique, it's completely non-invasive medical imaging technique, which you're using it for deep tissue imaging. So it's uh, unlike in microscopy or OCT, you look, you get extreme high resolution images. Here you're look, getting images of something deeper, but a lot more diffuse. You get functional information because you're looking at changes in response to a task rather than an anatomical change of a growth like a tumor. The, the whole technology can be made completely portable. And because of this, it's, you can also make it as inexpensive devices that you take to the patients rather than have the patients come to you like in an MRI or CT scans. The various applications we have focused in our lab, the ones in blue are the current ongoing applications. I'm not going to talk about the other ones. We have worked in breast cancer diagnostics, and we've also worked uh, in uh, cerebral palsy, autism-related studies, and functional brain mapping. By taking this technology, uh, building devices are a base to collect the information. So the steps that happens in our lab, we start from first designing and developing devices using this fundamental principle of light in that wavelength. So you have to pick a source, you pick a detector, then you assemble it based on the application. Then the related software development, which means how do you integrate it to a computer, extract all that information. Then how do you analyze the results? How do you validate your technique by doing phantom studies? And how do you do finally translate it into clinical studies, whether it be animal models or human subjects? This is a very small glimpse. Uh, the title, I'm sorry, that's getting covered up. It's just an example of the same thing. I'm showing it by pictures. The first one, design and production. Based on, this is one example case of our smartphone-based imaging technique that we have, uh, that I'm showing you the process. So we design, uh, of course, you have to know SOLIDWORKS. When you have to package something, you need to know the optics. Uh, you need to know electronics. You need to know how to put together PCB boards. How do you bring the whole thing and package to something so small? So all that happens in the lab. Then we have to develop interfacing software so that if you have to interface your device to a laptop, to a computer, or to a smartphone and extract and do automated imaging, you need to do know a lot of uh, programming aspects of it. Then you validate. So you need to have very good experimental setups in the lab to take a device, simulate a system as though there is change in oxygenation in a body, and you go ahead and use your devices that you develop and you do it. So we do a lot of ex vivo validation or phantom studies. Then before we take it to actual people with issues in the clinic, we have to do control subject studies, which means on normal people to see how what exactly are the challenges. So all of these different aspects goes on in the laboratory. So I'm just going to give you an overview of the different projects that my graduate students are working on. 
uh, Casey. She's uh, one of my senior PhD students. Uh, she's a co-inventor on the technology, which is a smartphone based. So what we did was we just got like simple LEDs and we, I told her once, go ahead and connect it to a cell phone and see if you can see anything out of it. That was how she started as an undergraduate. She was able to see a change. And I said, okay, go build the device now. So it was something that started off from Amazon for $5. And now it's a whole device. We have a couple of patents that we have filed on the technology. And what she has done is, if you look at the images on the top, when you take an image with something like a cell phone's camera, it's not gonna be high resolution. So you need to have other noise filtering techniques that you can remove the surface effects and start uh, seeing your bezels. So that's one example of a raw data and a filter data of how when you use uh, techniques like principal component analysis or singular value decomposition, techniques you can delineate which means even low cost devices can give good signals if appropriate math is applied on the left we started doing some studies i'm just giving you a big overview of all of our work is some of the studies she's doing on diabetic foot ulcers uh, this is a collaborative work we are doing with the university of uh, miami and their wound care center and department of dermatology where we take these devices to the clinic and the uh, we image them across weeks to see the changes in oxygenation, which you're seeing on the bottom, and how it uh, tends to show that the wound is healing underneath and not just on the surface. We also apply different techniques, which are called segmentation, because the doctor, when they see the pictures of colored and wound images, they cannot tell the difference. Where exactly is that wound, right? You want a full register and a segmented image. So these are maps that we develop. Again, a lot of image processing to say, this is the region of increased oxygenation with respect to what a doctor sees as a color image. So those are all the different aspects going on in this particular project. Another project, uh, another PhD student, almost ready to graduate, uh, Kevin Leva. Uh, he's also an F31 recipient. So a part of his project, and also this is uh, NIH funded work. What he does is he has a complete handheld device, which is not connected to smartphone, but it can also do dynamic imaging in real time. You can see those oxygenation changes, just like the vein finder. Have you heard of that? So in a vein finder, they just scan it and you should be able to see the veins. In here, we are trying to see real time changes in oxygenation with a time difference of 0.4 seconds. So within 0.4 seconds of what's happening, I can capture it on the surface of the skin. And when I see things dynamically, we can do perfusion studies, which means when I give you a task, like an occlusion, when I occlude your veins, or when I ask you to hold your breath and let go, if I see those changes, the normal tissue will have certain patterns of these changes, and a diseased tissue will have a different pattern of changes. And that difference can give us a lot more information of what's happening in the tissues. So condensing all his years of work, which is the device that you see there is the handheld one, we, take, we have taken it to the clinics. Uh, our collaborators are actually two aspects. One is we have done wound imaging studies where we see spatial maps and temporal maps. Temporal maps tell you that there is a change or there is a decreased perfusion in that particular region, which that asymmetry gives us a lot more complementary information than just looking at changes in oxygenation in spatial ways. Another project that he has uh, doing are, is also with in collaboration with Miami Cancer Institute, it's gonna come up in another slide also, is where we took the same technology now and we started using it on people who have had breast cancer or had had a post mastectomy or post mastectomy and now they're being treated for breast cancer by radiation therapy. When they get treated, it starts changing oxygenation and eventually if you don't monitor it, it can lead to ulceration as a secondary effect beyond the cancer. So what we have done is we tried to use our technique at the Miami Cancer Institute, went ahead and tried to do imaging studies, and we were clearly able to see the differences, which was also one of my master's students' work. Uh, we did the imaging studies on actual women with uh, breast cancer who were being treated across weeks over multiple subjects who were undergoing photon therapy, proton therapy, these are different kinds of therapy. And every therapy has a different effect on the body and how your body reacts to that nature of therapy. So when we did these imaging studies, we said, okay, we are able to see all these changes. We noticed that the proton was significantly impacting the tissue more than the photon therapy. All those were the conclusions that we drew. We noticed that 
even the tissue that did not get radiated, which is the contralateral tissue was getting impacted because of the radiation still happening from the radiated side of the tissue. So if the left breast tissue was uh, imaged, I mean, had a proton therapy or a photon therapy, even the right side was seeing changes. So that was the first time that we ever noticed that. Now, all that is not clinically significant, it's like answering questions, right? You want something that will help the patient. So what we realized is, we did another study to say, can I use this information even before they begin the radiation therapy and determine if the person is at risk for a higher level of ulceration, which is called radiation dermatitis, or are they at a lower risk? So our primary results were very exciting. Even before they started radiation therapy, we were able to image their left and the right side, which is the side that they're gonna get the treatment and the side that they're not gonna get the treatment. And we saw a clear difference that the ones which had a huge contrast, which is all the blue lights that you're seeing, G2 is great too, that is the ulceration level is high. The primary ulceration, the contrast between the left and right was significantly higher, which led to a greater ulceration in these patients, independent of their age, and independent of the nature of if they had a mastectomy or a lumpectomy. So that was very interesting. So we are work, continuing to work and recruit more patients as the next step to see if we can go ahead and make that as a predictor of uh, ulceration grading. She's a new PhD student. This is a very new work. We just started with Dr. Hutchison's lab. Uh, right now, is, I've been, if you notice, most of my studies have been on human subjects. This is the first time we actually set our foot into animal studies. So in this project, we are using the same technology. The technology remains the same, but applications are different. We are trying to see, can I see any peripheral vascular differences and changes in mice which are undergoing some kind of a chronic QD disease or arterial classification, uh, calcification, I'm sorry. So we take our device, our device is very portable. So we just take it in a box, go set it up, do the imaging and bring it back. That's, that's how the imaging system looks like. So we started a study just over the summer, and that's uh, Daniela, it's a few, uh, she's the incoming PhD student, but she's been in the lab even as an undergraduate. And when we were doing these imaging studies, we were trying to upload the veins, uh, the tail veins, because the tail veins and also is a peripheral aspect like a limb, and whatever changes you see in the limb, you're expected to see in the tail as well. So we said, let's upload and let go and see what happens. Now, what we noticed is as the occlusion occurred, that means you pumped it up and you relaxed. You can see the oxygenation when we were able to monitor the change very synchronously across all the five cycles. Now, more interesting, you're gonna see it next week in the undergraduate research that we got some very nice preliminary results showing that as the disease progressed, we were able to see that there was a change in the pattern of these oxygenations. So that was very exciting. That's the first time that we have actually seen something like that. And now we are trying to progress further to get uh, more data and see what exactly does it come in, in terms of what can we predict early on about these kidney diseases based on peripheral vascular imaging. Another new project we started off with computer sciences. Now that we have all these moon images, right? They're crazy. There's so many things. It should not be that only I can read or my students know how to read images. You want techniques where you can automate the process of giving useful information about these images. So we started working on applying machine learning techniques. Two areas that we're working on is when you look at a wound, look at the wound on the top left. I'm sorry, it looks, there are a lot more grossier pictures, but that's just an example. You can see a red, if I ask you, you can, you can demarcate and say, look, I see a white border. You know what, we know what that is, but we want the computer to start anatomically describing those changes. So that is one of the areas we want to do wound characterization. So we work with a nursing faculty who's an old expert, and also with uh, Dr. Wendell, he's in computer science who's a machine learning expert. So we provide all the images, we take all the images, and we are trying to develop models to categorize them. Second aspect, when you heard the, Dr. Shulian Zhao said, look, we are imaging the melanin on the surface. For us, melanin is almost uh, a negative effect, meaning if there's more melanin, whatever changes in oxygenation that's occurring, it's masked by the skin color. So if I don't take care of the skin color and I account for it, I may be getting errors in my reading that is because of the melanin, not because of the actual changes. 
So we are right now developing models to say automatically just looking at images of your wounds or your skin. Can I tell if this skin color is skin grade one or is it darker skin? And if you can do that, we can go ahead and mathematically account for these melanin concentrations. And that will help us make our imaging techniques more accurate in getting oxygenation, even if it were a cell phone or a low cost devices. So that's a very new project. So all these projects, of course, for every graduate student, there are like a couple of hundred graduates who work. So all their pictures are gonna show up less. Is that's the current team? There's always, do we look for students? Absolutely, for because now that you saw, there's experimental work, there is computational work, there is device development, machine learning. There's so many aspects that we keep looking at. App development is another part that we do. And uh, we also look into the commercialization side of things uh, in the lab. So there's uh, projects always open even for master's students. So with that, I'm open for questions. Thank you guys. Yes. You mentioned that the, uh, the more knowledge that's present, they have not to whatever or not have So, how exactly are you able to use the knowledge or quantify the amount of knowledge and then you have to figure out what you or you know, prevent that from causing errors in your imaging? Okay. So, when light gets absorbed, the light can be absorbed by the melanin, plus light can be absorbed by the oxygenation. Let's say oxyhemoglobin, let's say only two parameters. Now, these two, the, how much it got absorbed by melanin and oxygenation are combined because I'm not able to separate them. The moment I know how much got absorbed by melanin, it's a correction factor, right? I just have to remove one and keep the other. I'm just simplifying the whole math, but that's essentially what we're doing. So is, can I go ahead and uh, use the technique now in lighter skin and darker skin. And also sometimes there's variations in skin tone right there. Uh, when a wound is healing, if you all got a scrape, you see how you start getting those little black dots and there's a pigmentation, that's epithelization or granulation. So that also can mask things underneath. So we are trying to remove a layer, which is very important to make sure the technology is applicable. I mean, the device and the math is applicable for uh, across different skin tones. So uh, maybe this is a silly question, but how deep can you uh, use this uh, device and predict the healing of the kind of internal organ? Okay, like so the way we do, we are just imaging as I'm taking a snapshot picture. Okay, so when I do the non-contact area imaging, the depth definitely goes to the dermis and most of the things are happening in the dermis uh, for the wounds. Let's say if I want to do the use the same technology which we used in the past for functional brain imaging, I have to go through the skull, right? At that time, I wouldn't do a snapshot area. I would concentrate the light and send it through an optical fiber and collect it through an optical fiber so the light does penetrate. In that case, the technology can be up to two centimeters. Got it? So based on how you package your devices, your penetration depth because the interaction of how light goes in as a point versus an area is a little different. And then the area will be smaller. Yeah, but then, yeah, so yeah. that's how the device is packaged. So for each application, you have to see what, are you, what is it that you want to do? What kind of information you need? And you go out for a device like that. I will not take my cell phone camera now and put it on my brain and expect a signal, got it? At the same time, if I want to do a wound and something which is right on the surface, I would not take an imaging device that I would use for my brain and stick it there because first of all, the wounds are infectious, they're painful. I don't want those things to be contacting. They, they're not sanitized, they're not sterilized, right? So you have to know how you package your devices based on your application that you have for so. And we do that whole spectrum. That's why device development is a major part of the lab. I know I have a good question, very nice talk. Um, I just was wondering, uh, since you're looking at uh, oxygen, and we know that, uh, especially in certain pathologies during early disease, uh, oxygen, the variation of oxygen that's bound versus unbound in tissues changes. Is uh, near infrared uh, able to detect the levels of bound versus unbound oxygen content within a tissue? I'm just curious. Okay, indirectly, yes. 
because we are measuring what is called oxygen saturation, very similar to what comes out of your pulse oximeter. Mm -hmm. Now, there are relationships, which is called the Hills curve, where you can convert that to partial pressure of oxygen, free oxygen. Mm -hmm. So you can calculate this parameter, find the relationship, and convert it into the other parameters to be able to give that kind of feedback. Mm -hmm. So it should, I think it should be possible. But it's not like a direct parameter that I would measure, and it's already giving me that right. particular thing. But it is um, possible to go ahead and with some change processing. Yes, yes, with some processing and those things. Mm -hmm. As a secondary step, I think it should be possible. Great.